Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are we are going to learn today about seed starting from Kelly Kelly, who is going to wow us with her incredible knowledge. Uh, my name is Delise Weir. I'm privileged to sit on the board of the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden, and I'd like to just talk about a few housekeeping items um, before we get started. If you would like to see what people are saying across the screen in, in text at the bottom, there is a button you have to mouse down and then a little black bar comes up and you'll see a button that says live transcript. That will allow you to read as well as listen to the text. Also in that region, there's a button that's called Q&A and that's where you'll enter any questions you have during the show, the show, the slides. And um, we ask, Kelly asks, that you leave them to the end and we'll get to them in the Q&A session in the last half hour. If you have any technical issues, you can message Vanessa Ackerman directly and um, she can help you through the chat function. Next slide, please. Kelly, next slide. <laughs> We are so lucky today to learn from Kelly, who has just had her five-year anniversary at CASFAS. She loves the greenhouse. She spends a lot of her time there and uh, propagation is one of her primary functions. And she knows so much about seeds from beginning to end, from sowing them in the beginning, as we're gonna talk about today, to saving them at the end of the cycle. Um, and the greenhouse is where a lot of this action happens. She's going to share her deep knowledge and her special interest in cultural, culturally significant and nutrient dense crops. She teaches students, apprentices, and luckily us, the public. We love what she brings and her wealth of knowledge around seed, seed sovereignty and um, is very interested in empowering communities, which results in food equity and fostering ancestral healing. Um, love her spirit. She brings a special flavor to Caspas and the program, and we're lucky to have her. Next, please. This, this program, this workshop, is sponsored by the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden, which is a membership organization dedicated to connecting the community with the farm, and in doing so, supporting Caspas and the programs it offers. We urge you to join the Friends if you possibly can. You'll keep in touch with the program, you'll know what's going on ahead of schedule, you'll receive special discounts at certain places, um, events and uh, benefits that are available only to Friends members. It's worth your while, it's worth the money, and you do so much good in the world. If you'd like to see what people are saying, oh, never mind, I just read that. So um, you will receive this presentation after the class. Um, please open this up, click the link and join the friends if you can. Next. And now Kelly. Okay. Hi everybody. So glad you could join us today. Um, I'll just briefly describe myself for purposes of accessibility. Um, I'm an Asian person with short dark hair and medium height. I'm wearing a blue green plaid shirt and I'm sitting in the farm office in with lots of farm and garden books in the background. I wanted to begin and just offer a gratitude and thank you to all the seeds that our ancestors have given us the opportunity to care for and steward and all that we will learn from them together and in the future. We all come from incredible lineages of seed keepers and are deeply connected to our ancestors through our seeds and their stories. Our ancestral and community seed legacies are a really great reminder of our connection and responsibility to the land that we care for. So with that, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement for the land that I have the honor of stewarding. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Ayupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during the Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands to heal from historical trauma. 
So thinking about the connection between seed sovereignty and land sovereignty, seed rematri rematriation and land rematriation, and the importance of indigenous communities of this land being able to access and steward traditional and ceremonial lands, I'd like to share the current campaign of the Amamutsun to protect their sacred site, Uristok, which is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, currently being proposed by investment companies as a site for gravel and sand pit mining. So please visit their website to support and get more involved. So seeds when, are one of the most profound opportunities that we have to make intentional choices about our food and farming systems. We have an incredible opportunity when we work with seeds. Starting seeds is a way that we can grow and expand our community food sovereignty and grow things that we've saved seed from, grow varieties that are not available on the market in nurseries or in our region. It allows us to deepen our relationship with the plants that we work with. And the seeds that we choose come with the system behind them in the way that they were grown and the people that produce them. So today we'll be covering seed starting practices, how to vision and plan to start your seeds, tools and supplies needed, seed needs and what they need to get started, different techniques for sowing seeds and what sowing is, um, some seedling care practices, as well as how to deal with pests and diseases when they do come up. There are so many incredible technologies and techniques for starting seeds and growing seedlings around the world and innovative techniques that have been used in traditional farming systems and by indigenous farmers around the world. And practices that people use depend on what they have available, the climate, the system, and what's being grown. Um, seed drills have actually been used and developed in China thousands of years before being introduced in Europe around the second century BC and ended up being 30 times more effective than the European method of broadcasting seed and then raking it in where folks would actually need to save half of the seed they grew for replanting. Another incredible technology is chapinas, or traditional seed beds. This is a, images of the chinampas in um, what is Mexico today. It's uh, a traditional uh, Aztec farming technique in which people were growing on top of the wetlands. On the right hand side, you see um, people using mud to spread and that's spread and then dried and then cut into blocks called chapinas and holes are poked with a stick and seeds are dropped in and then covered with manure, which is an amazing technology. On the top left, you see a Depog rice nursery, which is a technique that originates in the Philippines and is now common in Southeast Asia where folks can grow seedlings without soil. And so many, so many people have different techniques of growing rice seedlings around the world. On the bottom right image, um, this is an image of the Jola community, uh, a rice growing people in southern Senegal who have amazing traditional ecological knowledge and grow different types of seedlings depending on the type of soil that they'll be growing in and use different types of techniques depending on the type of rice variety as well. So this is to say that the content that I share today is not meant to be a prescription, but rather information and tools to help you make decisions about what makes sense in your space and your environment with the goals, the vision, and the resources that you have. So we begin with visioning and planning. So we start to ask envisioning, what, what do I want to experience and eat and grow this year? Um, it allows us to work backwards as one of the key parts of starting healthy seeds that grow up to be healthy, productive plants is timing and not being too late, not being too early and knowing when the right windows are. For example, for delicious tomatoes that are going to be ready to harvest in July, August here in Santa Cruz, I need to essentially start those now. Whereas if I want to be enjoying lettuce, in August, I don't need to worry about that quite yet as lettuce is a fairly quick growing seedling and is a quick growing plant in the ground. So the first question we ask when we think about visioning is, should our plants be planted directly into the ground 
or should they be grown in a greenhouse or started as a seedling? So some often sown, off, things that are often sown as direct seeded crops are large seeded things like corn, beans, squash, cucumbers, melons, roots, or things that are planted densely like salad mixes and greens or herbs. Things that are commonly transplanted are solanums, which include peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, tomatillos, brassicas, including things like broccoli, collards, kale, alliums, and flowers. Um, however, you know, there are some decisions that you can make. It often depends on your system as well and what kind of environment there is in your garden. For instance, some things here on the farm will start as seedlings simply to give them a head start over some of the weed populations, even though they're crops that most folks can sow and do so um, right into the ground, such as summer squash or cucumbers. Some additional questions to ask are, how early or late can I plant this plant? Uh, how long will it take to grow as a seedling? And how much time does it need to grow in the ground? So to figure out this information, um, there's a couple of things we can look to. So firstly, we want to know how much sun exposure is in your region um, and how much sun your crops will need. Um, as you all know, spring is well on the way and um, so the equinox happens around March 21st and we're really seeing an increase in day length and sunlight and that starts to increase the range of what we can really grow. We can also look to frost dates in our region, knowing the, the last frost date is also a really critical um, piece of information to know when you can set out your plants without worrying about them. This is a tool that is on available on the Johnny's website that gives you information on how much time plants will take to grow in the greenhouse. Um, it's a really helpful tool. So it essentially allows you to input your frost date or the date that you want to plant. And it will give you um, on that second column, it'll give you an estimate of how long you'll need to start your seeds before you actually want to plant them in the ground. So there is, you can see there is a range. Um, some things take, you know, for instance, tomatoes will take a lot longer than a broccoli seedling. Um, so you'll wanna know how long will this plant take to grow as a seedling? And then next, we also wanna think about how long that plant needs in the ground. And of course that depends on your climate as well as the time of the year. Um, but this information can be found commonly on seed packets. Um, for instance, here on the top right, we say seed days to harvest, approximately 53 days. Um, and of course though, this, this can vary a lot depending on the varieties that you have as well as your climate and even the microclimates in your, in your area and in your garden. So tools and supplies are really important in being able to grow healthy seedlings. We first wanna think about soil, water, containers, temperature, and our seeds. So soil mix is actually a very important part of being able to create the environmental conditions that support seedling development. Um, a quality mix provides drainage, aeration, water retention, and the types of material, the ratio of materials in your recipe, the particle sizes, all these things will influence the quality and performance of your mix and essentially the health of your seedlings. You can buy quality seed starting mixes from local garden stores, but typically those labeled as uh, seed starting mixes do not have fertility in them. So you'll have to add a supplemental fertility source, which could include a uh, granular fertility, bone meal, compost, or even liquid fertility. So you'll wanna check the ingredients of your mix. 
Those mixes are usually only designed to get seeds started, but once seeds have begun growing, they need fertility um, after they've used their stored resources. Alternatively, you, you can use potting soil to start seeds, but it is often heavier and more chunky. So you may be able to sift it to make it a little bit more fine and amend it by adding um, some additional elements. It's helpful to be really careful about weed seeds getting mixed into your soil mix and also plant diseases, which could potentially come from unfinished compost um, or other sources. Water is obviously very important. Um, we wanna think about is the water available and at the quantity, quantity we need at the right time. Um, so the way that you deliver water is actually critical. Um, we want to have an even, fine, gentle distribution of water. So some really great tools for growing seedlings are um, hose, rose heads, like the green one depicted on the bottom left, um, or fine watering cans. And for very um, fine seeds, we often even use a spray bottle when they're first getting started so that the seeds don't get buried too deeply into the soil. So next, we want to think about our containers. And you can actually get very creative here. Um, you don't need fancy materials necessarily, but the, you really have a chance to upcycle and recycle things that might just be commonly around your home. Um, I love this image on the bottom, on the left-hand side. It's just I have plenty of eggshells, so I could definitely do that. Um, one thing you do want to think about, though, is that once things have sprouted and ha are showing their true leaves, you will want to make sure that they have drainage. Um, so these, even though this egg carton um, seedlings are really cute, soon we will need to move them up into a larger container so that they have enough root space and have good drainage. And um, you can also use your own creativity to create mini greenhouses out of recycled materials, such as what you see here. Or if you have available, you can use plug trays if you have access to these, such as the one on the left, which is a, a styrofoam seedling tray, or even just old nursery six, six packs, which is what you see on the right. Temperature control is really important. So we wanna think about how we'll create an environment for our seeds for them to thrive. Um, so some people use some, something called a cold frame on the top right, which is essentially just an, a, a mini, mini greenhouse which you can build really simply. Or on the left-hand side, even something called a, a hemodome, which is basically just plastic top to keep in humidity and moisture and control the temperature a little bit. Heat mats are also a very, very good resource to have. Um, on the bottom right, this is a heat mat, which you simply plug into any electrical source. And then on the right, you'll see a thermostat, which allows you to set the temperature of what you want to control the soil temperature to be by using the little probe on the end. And that way we can really precisely set the soil temperature for things like peppers, which like a soil temperature of up in the high 70s or um, almost 80 degrees. Some crops you know, prefer these high temperatures, whereas other cool season crops even prefer mid 60s. So we need to know what our crops want. Um, light and light is also really important. We wanna think about giving our seedlings enough light as they're growing. If not, they will be weak and spindly and leggy and stretchy. Uh, so wherever we're growing, we need to make sure that we have adequate access to light. And you can see here in these images, people have created various uh, structures for a protected environment to grow their seedlings. And some people have them starting in home greenhouses as well with artificial lights if you have very little light indoors. And then our last component, of course, is our seeds. Um, we have seeds are living, breathing organisms with a finite resource base. So germination really is dependent on the seeds being viable. 
So they need to have been stored well in a protected environment, meaning cool, dark, dry conditions and have a uh, good viability. And we wanna make sure that we're getting seed from a, a reputable source, um, whether that's your farmer friend or a good seed catalog. And lastly, we wanna think about, you know, what type of seed system and what type of seed we're using, whether it's something that's OP, open pollinated or a hybrid seed. So here's a chart that has some examples of what our seed viability looks like um, and how long they will last in adequate storage. You can find charts like this online. Um, we tried to sow some chives recently and they were a 2018 seed and none of them came up. Alliums have a notoriously short lifespan. But I recently ran a, a pepper trial with rare pepper seeds for a, from a seed bank and some of the seeds were 25 years old. So there is quite a range of lifespan. It just depends on what the seed is and how it was cared for. You can always test the germination of your seeds, which is an easy way to see if they're viable. So you take a sample of your seeds, um, either 10 or 100, and essentially lay them out on a moist surface, um, counting them and then watering them, and then letting them germinate and coming back and counting the, how much of your test has germinated, whether it's you know, 20 out of 100, five out of, five out of 10, and that gives you an idea of your germination rate. So we will begin to get into some sewing techniques. So what does sewing mean? So sewing is, it's, for me, it's just a specific term of working with seeds, uh, whether it's sewing them into flats in the greenhouse or sewing them in the ground. Whereas I feel like we usually say planting when we're planting seedlings. So when we are sowing seeds, the first thing that we'll want to do is make sure that our soil mix has adequate moisture. It should be not soaking wet nor dry. We'll want to add enough moisture so that it feels like a damp sponge after you've wrung all the water out. We'll next want to fill our containers. And it is really important that containers are filled evenly and to the top. If we don't do that, it allows, it creates essentially microclimates and uneven conditions, which allow pest and diseases to proliferate. So this is, it seems like a simple step, but it's actually a really important step in keeping your seedlings healthy. And don't forget that the, the soil level will also settle lower after it gets watered. So we'll really wanna make sure that it's filled up to the top of our containers and evenly. And of course, we need to remember to label very specifically our crop variety, crop type, and the sowing date. Don't forget to label, it's very important. You will not remember what you sowed two weeks later or where you put it. So seed depth and dibbling is another important piece to think about. When we're trying to think about how deep to sow our seeds, we'll look at the seeds and See how, see how big they are. Um, in general, larger seeds are sown more deeply. A good rule of thumb is that the depth that you sow seed should be two times the width or the circumference of the seed. Some seeds are much, much smaller. And so, and some seeds are so small, you know, they're almost like dust. And so we'll hardly cover those and sometimes not cover them at all. And in this process, we'll be making dibble holes. So dibbling is just what we call making depressions in the soil for our seeds to rest. And so we want to dibble to the size that's appropriate for the seed. I usually like to use my fingers so I can feel exactly how deep I'm making them. Some folks like to use chopsticks or a pencil and then we'll want to set our seeds in those dibble holes. Now here's an example of roselle which I grew. Uh, on the left you can see the dibble hole made and the seed resting in the indentation. And on the right is the whole flat um, of Roselle seed sown before being covered with soil. 
another technique for sowing seeds is using uh, rows in flats. Uh, this here is a pepper seed, pepper seeds that we sowed last week. And so this is a way to produce a very high density of plants in a small area. And that way it will only use a small amount of space and energy to care for lots of plants. So in this technique, we sowed 30 seeds per row in a flat that's about a foot long, a, a foot wide. And it's got about 15, 12 to 15 rows. So it's very, very high density. And obviously these plants can't stay in here for very long, but it allows us to start them in here and then have a high germination and success rate because we're only needing to worry about caring for this very small space. Another technique is broadcasting seeds into open flats or containers. I like to use this technique for things that are very, very small like snapdragon seed and hard to handle or things that don't necessarily have the best germination. So I can sow a high density of seeds without wasting too much space or things like alliums where they actually have a very shallow um, and not super developed root system like you see here. And covering our seeds, the way that we cover our seeds is another important component in thinking about sowing. On the left, you'll see an image of a flat that is covered quite thickly and so thickly to the point where it is inhibiting the germination of some of our lettuce. Um, so seeds, as we mentioned, are have a finite amount of resources in them and they have to be able to poke up and out of the soil and have their cotyledons emerge before they run out of resources. So if they're buried too deeply and they're a small seed, they'll run out of resources before being able to emerge from the soil and start producing their own food. So we wanna make sure that we're covering evenly and appropriately to the seed size. So what do seeds really need to get going? and begin their germination process. There are a number of important things that we need to think about and facilitate as their stewards. So first, we wanna think about breaking dormancy for the seeds. Most vegetables that we grow don't necessarily need special treatment. They've been bred to germinate just fine with some good old water, but some seeds uh, require processes such as stratification, where they are put into cold, such as the refrigerator, for a period of time. For instance, when we grow larkspur, we'll stratify it for a month before planting, before sowing, so that it mimics a period of cold that will allow the seeds to wake up. And we set it in sand. Some other seeds may need scarification. This is more common for things like native seeds, um, which mimics the process of them being either knocked around or scratched in their native environment, which then starts the process of breaking dormancy. And lastly, some seeds benefit from being soaked overnight in water to help get their metabolic processes going. Some things that we found that really benefit from this are parsley, sweet peas. So, we know that seeds need water to imbibe enough water to have their seed coat crack. Their seed, the seed will swell, the seed coat will crack, break off, and then the radical will pop out and the cotyledons will begin to emerge. And so at this time, it's a really critical moment to have enough water for this to happen, but not too much water. Because if we have too much water, we will be and we will be limiting the air. The seeds need to breathe and um, they are essentially also letting go of CO2. And so if we have too much water in our soil medium, we're not allowing the seeds to breathe enough. Um, that can also lead to fungal damage because we're crowding oxygen out of the pore spaces. And then lastly, we wanna think about our temperature for our seeds. Knowing the minimum and maximum thresholds at which our seeds can start is really important. We mentioned earlier that solanums 
things such as tomatoes, peppers, really like warm temperatures, they like to be started on heat, on heat if possible. Whereas something like lettuce, lettuce actually experiences thermodormancy at temperatures starting in the high 70s or 80 degrees, which can result in the seed actually uh, essentially stopping the physiological processes because lettuce is more of a cool season crop. So on days here on the farm where we have lettuce in the greenhouse and temperatures are getting up into the high 70s, we'll actually pull all of our trays of lettuce out of the greenhouse so that they don't experience thermodormancy. Sometimes they don't re-wake up. And because you're often, at least we're often growing a mixture of crops, you know, you'll want to provide special needs, special temperatures for those crops that really need it through using microclimates in your greenhouse, using heat mats, and also, um, but you'll need to choose essentially a, a temperature media where everybody can be happy if possible. So here's just a reminder, the temperature of the soil is super important. Lettuce germinates in temperatures best below 70 degrees, above 77 can cause thermodormancy. Whereas other things like warmer temperatures, such as solanums, eggplants, basil, um, which are up in, usually around 80 degrees, but some even to 90. We usually set our heat mats around 80 degrees for our solanums um, and have found that it really helps grow a healthier seedling faster and improves the germination rate. So most seeds need darkness to germinate, but some do require light. So it's about knowing what your specific seed needs. Typically we lightly cover seeds depending on the size of the seed, but there are some exceptions for seeds that like light, um, such as some flowers, um, snapdragons for instance. So you'll need to know exactly what your seed wants and likes. So once we've got our seeds started, we have to think about how we're gonna give the best care possible to our seedlings. And a lot of that is about providing the correct quantity of water at the right times. We know that seeds need water to germinate and grow healthy roots, um, but actually too much water creates the perfect conditions for fungal diseases to develop. And one of the most common problems that people have is actually overwatering. Um, and watering also needs to change and evolve as your seeds grow into seedlings. Typically we're watering shallow and more frequently when things are young and moving to increasing depth and decreasing frequency. Uh, let's see, so here's an example of some trays showing how dry soil looks compared to wet soil. And this is our visual indicator for watering. There are some exceptions to think about. Uh, solanums usually like more dry down and things that are larger seeded can be more likely to rot because they imbibe more water. Uh, so things like beans, cucurbits, actually like a larger dry down as well. We usually want to water earlier in the day so that plants have time to utilize that water during the day, but not be sitting wet overnight. That's the ideal scenario. We don't want to water first thing in the morning usually because it drops the soil temperature and potentially and the air temperature around the plants, but watering mid morning as we're going in to the sunniest part of the day is ideal. So here you'll see that we have the first stage. I'm gonna walk through the stages of what some seedlings look like so we can talk about care during each of these different stages. So here we see that we have emergence and the first cotyledons of this broccoli. With the first cotyledons, we have cotyledons or seed leaves, which you see here are shaped like little hearts, brassica, Cotyledons usually look like little hearts. They are a signifier of the beginning of 
uh, a root system that will just start to branch. Initially, we want to meet, we want to water just enough to meet the emerging roots of the young seedling. At this stage, we can water when the surface is 75% dry, but we want to water more deeply than we would if the seeds were just sown and less frequently. Here at the next stage, you can see that we have true leaves. And at this stage, seedlings have, um, they're more tolerant of a temperature range than in their germination phase. Here we can also begin supplying liquid fertility if there was not fertility in our mix. And we'll want to increase watering depth to, to encourage deeper roots. If we don't water deeply enough at this stage in our seedling life cycle, the root system will not develop strongly. So we want to make sure that we're watering to the depth of the roots and even a little bit deeper to encourage the development of that root system. We also see here that adequate light is very significant at this point in the seed life cycle. If they don't have adequate light at this stage, even though they may have looked good to begin with, they'll start to get leggy and spindly and weak. Uh, we really need light at this stage to manufacture nutrients through photosynthesis and promote strong cellular growth. And here you'll see that we have more mature seedlings that have started to develop multiple sets of true leaves. So we want to water down to the bottom of the tray at this stage to root, reach roots that are at the bottom. We'll want to water when the surface is 100% dry and even dry to half an inch down into the soil. So again, we're watering with less frequency than before, but watering more deeply each time. At this stage, we'll also want to consider, uh, here's, a, here's a chart in case uh, folks need a reminder of what we just discussed of when to water, how much to water at what life cycle. At this stage, we'll also want to consider um, holding strategies if needed, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Pricking out or potting up can be a really important part of your seedling life cycle process. Pricking out is something, a technique that's used when you grow seedlings in a very high density and need to move them up into larger containers. So in this image, you'll see our tomato seedlings are extremely large and definitely not going to get enough nutrients or root space in this box very soon. Uh, however, it was a very effective way to begin them when we only had needed to care for this small box instead of 700 tomato plants. So in this instance, we'll prick out the tomatoes and move them up into larger containers. It can be really stressful for the seedlings, but if we think about the environment and prick out in a cool time and a protected environment, that can make it less stressful. On the left hand side, you'll see our peppers sown in rows at a really high density. And on the right side, you'll see what they look like when they're very ready, more than ready to get out of that flat. And so they will get potted up into three inch containers actually for sale or for use. So we're moving them up. And at this stage, it's really critical to protect them after you've pricked them out. They can be pretty sensitive. So usually we'll put them in a somewhat um, protected area of the greenhouse, even under the tables or under a shade cloth so that they don't experience too much stress after being moved up. Here's an example of roselle or hibiscus, which was sown in this um, plug tray and then moved up into a 30 into a three inch container to give it a lot more space. This is an image of the development, the root development of a snapdragon seedling. You can see on the right hand, the, the right 
seedling is it's very, very small, but it's actually got a fairly developed root system. Typically the true leaves, the first leaves that look like the plant's actual leaves, the ones that come after the cotyledons, the emergence of true leaves are a good indicator that the plant is strong enough to be pricked out. So in this image, I would recommend pricking out somewhere between the first seedling on the right and the seedling in the middle. Even though they're quite small, the thing that we look at is the development of the root system and the emergence of true leaves when we're looking at how to prick out and when. So just a reminder, um, pricking out requires looking for the first set of true leaves and the corresponding development of a branching root system. Usually when we're pricking out, it actually helps to have the soil moisture a little bit dry so we can separate the plants a little bit easier. Holding the seedlings by the leaves and not the stem is actually helpful because if you break the stem, that's the end. But if you damage the leaves a little bit, the seedlings are more likely to recover. And then again, thinking about our protected, protecting our seedlings and having uh, minimizing the stress that they experience as they're moving is also important. So minimizing the time that roots are exposed to air as well as having a nice place for them to land is really important. And at this stage, we also just wanna to continue to think about making sure that we have adequate light for our seedlings. This is a really good slide to show what happens when your seedlings are getting too leggy. They'll stretch to reach the light source. They'll become stringy and weak. And you know this is caused by not having enough light. And sometimes you can amend this by switching your container around, moving the location, and making sure that they're not in too hot of a temperature. We also want to be able to recognize the qualities of a seedling that are that is mature enough to plant. So in this image on the bottom, you'll see lettuce seedlings that have a very well developed root ball. We call it a root knit in which we can pick them up and all the soil and roots will hold together. There are multiple sets of true leaves developed and we have a really nice root to shoot balance. On the top left, there's an example of a lettuce seedling that's slightly less developed. You can see the root knit is a little bit less strong. At this process, at this point in the process, when we have a mature seedling, hopefully we were thinking about hardening off or we've already hardened off our plants. And hardening off is just the process of setting our seedlings outside of their protected environment, whether that's a cold frame or a greenhouse and setting them out into the normal light and temperature, normal light conditions and air temperatures of your environment. And that allows the plants to really acclimate before they get transplanted so that we can reduce transplant shock. It allows them to build stronger stems and also build up their carbohydrate reserves so they have less, less shock as they're moved. Here is a reminder of hardening off. So you'll wanna think about protecting your seedlings as well if you have critters we have rats sometimes in our greenhouse zone, so we need to think about protecting seedlings from them, typically by covering our seedlings with cloth at night. And there are some plants that are more sensitive to being planted out on time than others. Here is an example of some things that are very sensitive to waiting too long. Uh, things that are a heading crop like cabbage, broccoli are very sensitive, as well as things like squashes and melons, they'll quickly decline if they are, if the seedlings are left too long without being put into ground. There are also lots of flowers that are very sensitive to being transplanted too late. On the other hand, there are some crops that rebound really well if you let them linger a little bit longer than ideal. Some examples are tomatoes, 
kale, chard, so leafy greens that are not heading necessarily, leeks, shallots, and there are some flowers that are much more resilient than others. In the case that we do not have the ability to plant out as soon as our seedlings are ready, there are some things that we can do to help our seedlings stay healthy while we're getting things ready. So one, we can move them outside of our greenhouse or protected environment. That allows them to slow their growth down. Sometimes we could put things into the shade or give them extra fertility so that uh, there's when they've run out of the nutrients that are in their cells or containers, they have a little bit of extra boost. Another technique, although it does require labor, is moving things up into larger containers to give you more time to prepare your soil. However, uh, unfortunately, there's always the time when we have left things too long. So it is important also to be able to recognize when it's time to let go. Um, some signs of that are if your plants are getting significantly discolored, like this broccoli seedlings here. This is from a trial that we did. So these have been in their cells for far too long. Woody stems is a good example of when to let go. Root discoloration or root, roots being bound. Another indicator is bolting. So things starting to flower and are button prematurely. That's a sign that if you plant that thing in the ground, it's most likely not going to grow full size or not going to grow to a very healthy state. Okay, so pest and disease issues do come up. So I, I'm going to share some strategies for thinking about how to work through them when they do come up. Just like in life, what you pay attention to in your seedlings tends to grow. So thinking about preventative practices is critical and the most important piece in growing healthy seedlings. The most important thing that we have as a creating a good environment for plants is uh, being able to create an environment that limits conditions for diseases. So the way that we do that is by watering the appropriate amount at the appropriate time, not letting things sit wet and cold overnight, giving good dry down, having really good air circulation. Air circulation is critical to the point where we will sacrifice temperature, ideal temperatures for air circulation to reduce disease risk. And as soon as we do recognize a problem, we wanna address it really, really soon, as soon as we can, because things in plant world can tend to grow rather quickly. So our main techniques for limiting pest and disease, firstly, our prevention and monitoring, and then as a last step, we think about intervention and treatment. Prevention is really our best strategy, especially in an organic situation. We can think about many components of our system from making sure that we have sanitize, sanitary containers, clean tools, clean surfaces where we work and are seeding and are potting up. And we also wanna think about having a pathogen-free soil mix. Having a well aerated soil media with a good texture, good air circulation is one way to do this. And as a reminder, overly wet soil is not a good thing. It creates the ideal conditions for disease. Overwatering is a really common problem and can also create conditions in which pests will thrive. There are some things that you can introduce into your soil, which can be beneficial such as root shield is something we use root shield or trichoderma harzania is a beneficial fungus which provides a competitor to harmful fungus the way that we grow seedlings also can be a preventative strategy if we grow seedlings that have too much fertility that are overly lush and nitrogenous 
that will attract insects that really like these nitrogen rich crops, especially aphids. So we want to make sure that our seedlings are growing at the proper um, or your, wherever you're growing them so they don't linger too long and create a long-term environment for pests or pathogens. Monitoring is really important. You want to observe things so that you can catch them before they become a big issue. It's helpful to know which of your plants are sensitive to which problems, which crops, and what patterns occur in your area and at what times of the year. And some crops are more, some varieties of specific crops are more vulnerable. And we want to make sure we're growing things at the right time of year. Having a hand lens can be really helpful because identifying what we're experiencing and what insect or pest issue you may have is the first step in being able to address it. When we think about intervention, we want to first think about how we change our own practices before we do anything else. So this may require changing our watering and temperature controls to make an environment that, aren't, that isn't so conducive to supporting the pest or pathogen issue. You know, overly wet conditions can cause algae, pathogens, and be a breeding ground for fungus gnats, shore flies, and other diseases when there's not enough air circulation. So allowing more dry down will decrease uh, the risk of these things. If we do have a problem, an initial step can be uh, isolating or quarantining your plants, taking them away from your other plants so they don't spread something that they might have. Moving seedlings outside can also help reduce aphid issues. When aphids are exposed to the light and temperatures of outside, the populations tend to decrease a lot. And then lastly, very lastly, you can think about some types of control and treatment, such as using something like a safer soap. The safer soap is a fairly mild product, which you can apply, for instance, if you have aphids directly onto the aphids, and it's a product that um, dissolves the exoskeleton of the aphids um, and directly controls them that way. One technique if you're having soil that's overly wet and starting to build algae is sprinkling a little bit of dry peat on top to change the acidity of the soil and also help the soil dry out and wick moisture out to change the chemistry a little bit. So some common issues that you may come upon. One is damping off. Damping off is what you see here in these images where Typically the stem becomes pinched at the soil line and you start to see the, the stem begin to rot or darken. Sometimes your seedlings fall down. Damping off can spread really quickly in a greenhouse or through your seedlings. So we always wanna think about preventing this and monitoring for it. And again, the best way to prevent this is by using is by applying the proper amount of water at the proper time and not letting your plants sit too wet for too long. Some other common issues that you may come upon are aphids. They love things like peppers and eggplants. So you can treat those with safer soap. It needs to be applied directly onto them. Another common thing you may find is leaf miner. In this middle image, you'll see uh, leaf miner is an insect that buries into the leaf tissue and then lays its eggs and then the larvae hatch in the leaf. So we don't want to compost this or just drop it on the floor because those insects will come out of the leaf and continue the cycle. So we actually want to dispose of those leaves. And here's another image of damping off, a tomato seedling showing damp damping off. Some other things that folks might experience are fungus gnats on the left, which are extremely harmful. They lay their eggs in soil that has algae that's overly wet, and they will feed on the developing root systems of your plants and can be extremely devastating. On the right-hand side, you'll see something that 
to you know to a naked eye can appear pretty similar looking but is actually not very harmful this is something that we have here it's called a shore fly they just kind of fly around but they don't actually harm the plants too much and they also proliferate in conditions that are overly wet where there's algae so that's um, everything in brief thank you for joining us hopefully that's a good amount of information to get you and your seeds started. And I'll hand it back over to Delise to share some more information. Thank you, Kelly. We um, got a lot of questions, so we're gonna get back to Q&A in a minute, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that are coming up. On March 4th, we are doing a class in growing Asian vegetables and on the 20th, we're doing irrigation basics. And these are both with former apprentices at the farm and garden. So those are gonna be wonderful. Next, you can sign up for those now on the CASWIS website. Can you progress the slide for me? These classes or workshops um, in the past, we had them in rooms with humans sitting next to each other. And for the purposes of, of this time of life, we are doing them for free and online. Um, we, we still need the income. The work cannot happen without you. Um, we would really encourage you to go and donate directly at this link to CASFIS. Its programs are funded in large part by donations and um, it's essential that you, um, that you help us with that if you have that capability. And we know that not everybody does. Next, please. And as Kelly mentioned before, the land under our feet is very important. Um, the core of the Castus work is responsible, sustainable land stewardship. You in your own backyards are land stewards as well. And we're honoring the Amamutsan um, tribal bands descendants, the descendants of the original stewards of the land who are now the Amamutsan tribal band. So we really encourage you to go to their website, understand their history and support their work. Alrighty, shall we go to some questions? All right, so we had a question about um, a seed on one of the early slides. Is it bitter melon, that sort of uh, rough edge seed in the beginning? Yes, great ID. <laughs> bitter melon are beautiful seeds. They are. Um, does frost date matter in Santa Cruz County? It does, but you know, frost is not obviously as much of a concern here as in other places. Generally, we're thinking more about overall temperature as in, you know, us growing cucumbers now, although they're not necessarily gonna be frost, you know, have a frost, they're just not gonna be super happy and not gonna thrive. So, you know, we tend to think more about temperature, temperatures generally when, what to, when we think about what to put out here compared to other places. We've had a couple of people that are interested in the uh, cone-shaped seed starting trays and want to know where to, where to find them. Speed link, ah. et cetera. Yes, those come from a company called a Speedling, Speedling. Um, and I am not sure if you're able to get them in small quantities. Um, Delise, maybe you could speak more. If you are, you can, get them, you can get them on Amazon and that sort of thing. It's an online thing, but you don't know a vendor in, in in the area that I don't know a vendor in the Santa Cruz area that sells those at small quantities. Okay. We had a question about sources for seeds and I know that we can send a list in the uh, resources after the fact, but is there anything you want to highlight? Sure. There are some amazing seed companies out there and more that are continuing to grow and evolve. Um, one that I highly recommend is True Love Seeds. They are uh, 
based in the Hudson Valley, but they source seeds from farmers um, in many different regions of the US. So you can look at seeds that are particular to the region that you're from. Um, wherever you buy seeds from, I really recommend, if possible, buying seeds that are adapted to our region or your region, um, as that'll provide the most healthy plant for you as the, they've learned the wisdom of your land and they've adapted and evolved over time. So if you can, buying locally produced seeds is ideal. They'll be adapted to your bioregion. Um, some other seeds, seed companies that I recommend are adaptive seeds. They do incredible work. Uh, Southern Seed Exposure, Hirazawa Seeds, and there's a, a longer list in the resources that we'll share with you all. And I'm sure that other folks in the audience also have recommendations uh, for places to get seeds as well, but those are some of my favorites. Great, thank you. We had a couple of questions about seed starting medium. Um, what are the ingredients, what to use? Are they really, um, are they really uh, pathogen free? Can you count on that? Mm -hmm. um, and then fertilizing, how do you, um, how do you add fertility and how much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So when you buy a seed starting mix, sometimes they're called a propagation mix from a nursery or a local garden center, those are typically sterile mixes because they don't have living soil in them. They don't necessarily have compost. So they are they are going to be pathogen free, essentially. It's more when we introduce our own compost, for example, that we're worrying about the spread of pathogens or even recycled plant diseases from last season that may not have properly processed through our system. So when we buy that type of product, they are you know, essentially sterile and we don't really need to worry about pathogens. But we do need to worry about providing fertility if there is not a fertility source in the soil mix. So that fertility can come in a number of different ways. Um, a very easy way to do it is by mixing in a good compost source. Um, you'll want to mix in compost at a rate, uh, let's see, you know, that is not changing the texture of your soil mix too much but really providing enough fertility. So one ratio that we have used in the past is sort of a one third ratio of you know, compost to what your mix is or one fourth. Um, you can also use products like bone meal to apply fertility. You wanna make sure that whatever you're using will provide the fertility and the amount of time for the plants to access it in the greenhouse or in your seedling life cycle because some, some things with delayed fertility release will not be accessible quick enough. So something like blood meal will actually provide the nutrients uh, relatively quickly. The other thing that a lot of people who grow seedlings use is liquid fertility. We didn't talk about this too much, but commonly fish emulsion or something like AgroThrive, which is available to consumers you know, in smaller bottles is something that you can just readily mix up in a watering can and apply as a soil drench, soil and foliar drench, and that'll help with supplemental fertility. And you can apply that once a week. You know, it's usually, there's usually a dilution rate on the product, but it's, you know, it's not very much for a watering can, maybe like a half a cup or something like that ratio. Um, so those are some examples of how you can apply fertility to your seedlings if you're growing and starting seeds in a mix that don't have, that doesn't have fertility. Hopefully that's helpful. That's great. Do you have any tricks for sowing any beanie, teeny, tiny seeds? Yeah, <laughs> those are super tricky. <laughs> and if you, don't do it right, it can be sad. Nothing will grow, um, which I've had happen. So my tricks are usually to sow 
very, very lightly, you know, on the surface, essentially just spreading those seeds on the surface, the soil surface, not covering them or covering extremely lightly with a fine vermiculite. Vermiculite, you know, comes in various grades. It's the kind of shiny metallic um, material that you commonly see in soil mix and it holds water. So that, that can be either don't cover it at all or cover it with a very fine layer of a fine grade of vermiculite. And then when you water, watering is really important. If we water snapdragons with the normal watering wand that we use for other things, the seeds end up buried and they don't germinate. So for snapdragons, we'll either use a little thing that provides a mist or allow them to get misted from our autom automatic system. So for things that are really small, I would consider a, you know, just a spray bottle and making sure that those seeds are not getting too deep. But because they're so shallow, you will need to make sure that they are kept with the moisture that they need because they're really on the surface. And how do you get them spread out without getting them all kind of all up in one place? Yes. Um, what I like to do is pretty simple. I'll fold up a piece of cardstock and pour all the seeds into it and then sort of tap them out in, the, you know, it's not perfect, but it allows me to control the flow of them so I can top them out um, either in lines in a flat or broadcast it in a more coordinated way. Cool. Maybe other folks have techniques that they've found effective too and can share in the chat. Someone wants to know if you um, use capillary mats. We do not, no. Okay, can you tell us why? Um, we do not use, so I'm assuming that that person is kind of talking about a system in which you water from underneath, just to clarify for folks, either by things, you know, water being delivered through a system underneath or um, things sort of sitting in water and then uptaking it as they need. Um, we don't use that kind of system, and I don't think plan to. One, we have a lot of diversity of crops and crop types, and things move around in our system from one stage to another quite frequently. And so I think that when we're growing such a diversity, it would be fairly difficult to manage uh, in that way. And we also, um, yeah, we don't... Uh, we have really good results with producing seedlings in the ways that we have had. And so, you know, that kind of system does require a lot more infrastructure as well as up that to the extent that you can when you're able to get effective results um, is helpful. Well, that speaks volumes. <laughs> yeah, we have enough to maintain as it is. Yeah. We had a lot of people ask about the orientation of the seed, like a large seed. Does it matter if it's on its side, on its front, on its back? Oh, I love that question. I have not found that it matters a ton. Usually the seeds, larger seeded things will tend to kind of orient themselves a little bit as they need to when they push out their radical and the roots start coming out. So it's not super important from my experience, you know, that you face them all up or face them all on their stomach. Yeah, that would be some very careful planting of fava beans. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> tedious. Yes. Do you know of a central source where there's a list of germination temps and scarification techniques for um, a variety of types of seeds? I believe. I I yeah. believe that we have a list of germination of ideal temperatures, soil temperatures for germination in the Tafka manual. So that's available on the CASFIS website. And I believe the link, the should be able to share either a link to that now or in the resources that will get sent out. Um, 
folks can also go to the website and look that up. We have listed the ideal germination temperatures and then the ideal growing temperatures for various crops, which is helpful to know. Well, somebody asked um, the size of the container, does it matter? And is that relative to the size of the seed? And how, what's your rule of thumb for gauging that? Oh, yeah. So when I'm choosing a container, I'll think about the, the personality and needs of the plant. Usually uh, things that are larger seeded will grow pretty quickly and require more root space and have pretty extensive root systems. So I would be worried about putting a squash seed or a sunflower seed in a pretty small container. Um, but, you know, just from getting to know plants and learning about them, you also sort of start to learn which things really like a lot of root space just because they do um, versus things that don't actually have really big root systems like those onions. You know, onions have a pretty shallow root system and you could you can see from the way that we sow them, we sow them in flats, maybe 500 plants in a really small one by eight inches flat. So that's hundreds of seedlings in a very small space because we know that they don't have an extensive root system. So I would say thinking about the root nature of your plant as well as how quickly they use fertility is a way that I think about what type of container they'll need to be in, as well as the kind of practices that I use and my ability to plant things out quickly. If I know that I kind of linger on things and you know perhaps aren't able to have the soil ready, I would plant things in bigger containers so that they have more time in there before they run out of nutrients and root space. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about reusing pots safely? Oh, great question. Um, yes, so we, you know, usually if there's not a specific concern, I feel that spraying pots out or trays with a strong water stream and then setting it out in the warm sun to solarize is enough of a sanitation practice. However, if you have had a recognizable pest, a, a disease issue, I would definitely go through a, probably a more involved process of sanitation, which might look like um, a bleach spray or even a sanitate spray um, on your containers uh, to, to hopefully kill whatever that was. So usually we don't worry too much about it unless there's an identifiable issue. So I feel like spraying out soil remnants, root remnants, and then letting them kind of sit out in the warm sun is enough. Okay. Um, checking recent questions. Um, if you germinate older seed, are they gonna lose bigger? We're talking about 10 year old tomato seeds. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Older seeds can definitely be less vigorous. They can be less vigorous in general, you know, as a seed, they can have uh, less strong seedling and they can perform less, they can perform not as well when they're out in the field. So definitely, you know, um, I would say that younger, newer seed is ideal. However, if you are able to grow a healthy seedling, that's a pretty good indication, I feel, that you'll have a healthy plant. So if there's enough resources in that seed, enough stored resources that have been there over the years, and you can grow a strong, healthy seedling, I feel no concern about planting it out, even if it's an older seed, which I found last year when I grew out pepper seeds that were 25 years old. That's amazing. Yeah, it was really surprising. Some germination rates of 80%. So they were stored in a cool, deep storage, you know, uh, below very, very low temperature where the metabolism was almost stopped. So that does contribute for sure, but I was still amazed. 
Okay, we have a person here who has seed trays, but they don't have plastic dome covers. She's wondering if she should use plastic wrap on top of the seed tray. Oh, um, that is a technique for sure. I would be careful about if you use plastic wrap, you want to you either want to have it on there for only a short amount of time, just as the seedling seeds are germinating and then remove it. Or you'd want, eh, I, I don't know, plastic wrap seems sort of difficult to work with. Um, some people use sort of thicker, thicker plastic that's a little bit more, uh, a little bit less clingy, I guess. Plastic wrap feels really difficult to work with. But if you do try, you know, you can always try. I feel that you'll want to remove it as soon as things germinate. You know, it would probably be best just for letting things grow, um, creating a really humid, moist contained environment for seeds to germinate. But then after that, I think it would actually not allow enough air, air, you know, airflow and breathing. And I think it would be a little bit difficult to sort of take it off and take it on to create airflow. That's my sense. We have a lot of people asking for the seed starting soil recipes, which I know they're in um, one of the online documents. So we'll, we can forward that in the reference material that comes later. Mm -hmm. Here's somebody who sows fine seeds with sand to help spread them out. That's a great uh, idea. Yeah, as long as your sand is, is not weighing down your mix too much, um, sand can be helpful in helping you pick up the seeds so that you can actually handle them. And not salty beach sand. <laughs> yes, Should be not Santa charged. Cruz beach sand, no. Yeah. Okay. I think we've answered most of these. There's some questions about using worm compost and worm compost tea to fertilize and to add to the mix. Oh yeah, worm compost tea and worm castings are great. Uh, you could mix it into your soil mix. You could mix the soil castings into your soil mix as a substitute for compost or substitute for part of your compost. Um, worm castings provide a lot of really good micronutrients. So that's great. And if you're doing worm tea, uh, that's a really good way to sort of inoculate your plants with beneficial microbes. So if you have the energy to do that, um, you know, I think it's great for both young plants and older plants. Um, yeah. Someone has mentioned that um, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply has speedling flats and you can get them there. Yeah. And we have someone asking if you're going to be doing a seed saving class. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Delise, are you hosting? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, often ask Kelly at the end of the growing season to do that class. So hopefully we'll get to do that again this year. Yeah, that's actually my favorite class. It's a great one. It's really fun. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Kelly, so much for all your knowledge. Um, and we'll be sending you more info. Thank you all for attending and for your great questions and ideas. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Delise, for hosting. And thank you, Vanessa and Aaron, for technical support. Enjoy the weather. <laughs>